Okay. So recording this, obviously everyone gets to uh, view this, but I'm so glad to have Glenn with us, Glenn Barth with us. He's gonna be sharing here in a little bit. Um, I'd like to just start off, we can start off in you know time of prayer. And um, Jim Todd, can you uh, lead our time in prayer? Do you hear us, we'll Jim? Do. There you go. We'll do. Thank you. God, thanks for what we get to do together. Um, beyond walls, beyond uh, facilities, in our communities to make a difference. We just pray that you'd be noticed um, through some of our administration, our connections, our, our um, dreams to just come alongside uh, pockets of people and say, let's do life together. God, thanks for what's ahead in this meeting. Uh, sharpen us and prepare us for what's ahead. And we look to you and we look to you in Jesus name. Amen. 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 All right. Hey, just a reminder about the vision of, of Love Our Cities here is, is to love our cities like Jesus does so that our cities will thrive. That's that's the whole point of all this. The, our mission, our purpose here really is threefold here is we want to help cities lead citywide volunteer days. I mean, that that's the number one, the Cadillac event, having that that volunteer days we found is obviously super impactful, but this, it doesn't end there though. That's not the ultimate goal. The ultimate, it keeps going on here and that is to facilitate um, year round involvement. Um, we wanna see uh, initiatives happening year round, not just the one day a year. And thirdly is once we do all this, we become citywide conveners. And it's amazing to see how, how this, our cities are looking to us to not just be at the table, but the lead the table discussions and in so doing we're all networking and collaborating like we're doing here we're all in this together our cities are different but man they're so much alike too aren't they um so hey this fall here's going to be some cities that i know that are taking place um they're having their citywide volunteer days uh, or a volunteer emphasis in los on uh, september 16th most of our cities are in the spring but there's a few here in the fall which is really exciting September 16th, Los Alamitos um, out of LA County. Uh, September 24th, uh, Irvine, love Irvine, love Hab La Habra. Um, and then on October 1st, Colorado Springs, Orange, um, in Southern California, Stockton, Ventura, Florence, have an all month kind of focus, Chris. And Slocomi Valley have an all month focus as well up in uh, Northern Washington. And uh, October 8th, uh, New Brunfels, uh, Texas, and then Riverside and Salida. And then October 15th, uh, Newport Beach, a new city jumping on board, uh, Newport Beach. There's worse places to go to in the world than uh, Newport Beach and a few <laughs> beautiful place down there. But hey, every city has its challenges. It might look great on the outside, but every city's got lots of challenges. Uh, Tustin, I'm not sure on Tustin's dates yet, um, but I know are there are other cities and in, in counties or areas that do you all know of? Am I missing anything or did he get any dates wrong that you guys might know of? Please give me some feedback here. I see, um, chat here. Let's see, Nathan says, okay, Anaheim is September 3rd. Very good. Thank you, Nate. Anaheim. All right, so super excited for a number of cities that are happening here this fall. As it gets closer, we'll be talking about them more and praying for them as well. Hey, a couple of housekeeping things. Uh, one, and I, I get a number of these. I'm going to share this with you so you can see it. Um, oh, great. Where'd it go? No, I can't find it. Oh, it's always hilarious when you prepare something. Oh, there it is. So this is a this is what we call a scam letter. Okay, I don't know if any of you uh, you guys have received this before or something like this. Chris sent me this this last week, and I get a number of them. Um, and and I've heard from many of you get these too. And you're probably going, wait a minute, didn't I pay Love Our Cities for the domain name? Why am I getting these letters here? Well, there's obviously bad people out there that wanting to get your money, and they they know that you oversee a website. And so they send this to you, but, but it is true that we do pay your domain. We have, we own your, everyone's domain names. Okay. We pay it every year. We have an auto pay on it. So you don't have to worry about any of that stuff, any website stuff you don't need to worry about. We obviously develop the website, we manage the website and, and as well as these domain names. So if you get any of these letters, 
you know, just ignore them um, because they're trying to scam you. <laughs> um, second thing here is our book update. I've shared this uh, over the last three years. We've been finally our book is happening. It took it took three years though. And it was quite a journey for three years, but uh, October, middle of October, uh, I guess I receive author copies. And Glenn, you know how all this goes here. And then the pre-sales begin next April's public release. I'm like, seriously, it's taken that long for, but I guess that's just how it works. Time you get, you know, all the marketing and book goes where it needs to go and all the promotion and all that kind of stuff. Uh, next April will be the public release. And uh, we have our subtitle. Uh, the title of the book is Love Our Cities. And the subtitle is How a Citywide Volunteer Day Can Unite Your Community. And I think with so much division and you know, dividedness going on right now, um, the publisher really loved this idea of kind of the idea of, of uniting our communities. And um, so super excited by this. Now, what this means for you all is I want to get you guys a copy of this book as soon as I can. Uh, it might be by digital because I don't know, you know, the hard copy wise, I don't know how to, I don't, maybe we can figure that out. Uh, but I do want to get that to you as soon as possible. A hundred percent of the profits of this book go to Lover Cities. So this isn't an author thing um, where Eric and I, Eric Young and I, who wrote this together, um, it, it doesn't go to us. It's, we really want this to go back into this organization and so that we can build this thing up. Um, the, the goal here, obviously, you know, of, our 10-year goal here is helping a thousand cities in the next 10 years. So we really believe that maybe this book will be a tool, one of many things that, you know, that we can wave around and, and uh, go places and, and share it. And hopefully more cities can jump on board. The audience of this book is, yeah, Christian leaders, but it's also community leaders who know Christian leaders, you know, um, to get more cities on board. Another cool thing this last week, I signed a contract for a follow-up book already, uh, a devotional. It's like a 40-day devotional. So me and uh, my writer, um, Kevin O'Brien, we're gonna you know, put, write this thing together. We'll be these 40-day uh, devotional. We got a number of publishers that are interested. And so I haven't signed that contract yet, but we're on our way. So maybe even later next year, there might be a 40-day devotional that goes hand in hand with this. And then we're dreaming of more devotionals as well down the line. We'll see where this goes. Um, but I'm really excited by this, and I appreciate all you guys' support. Um, many of us, our cities are focused in this book. Um, we got profiles of 10 different cities, and um, <clears throat> just really, really excited just to get this in your guys' hands so that you can share this with others as well here. All right. I am so excited to have our guest with us, Glenn Barth. I met Glenn over 10 years ago. I was about a year or two years into leading, starting Love Modesto in California here. And I was just getting started. I was still working at a church. And um, my friend, John Evans, who's on our board right now, who was on, I think you're a board, Glenn, is um, he invited me. He's from this town. He said, hey, you need to come to this, this conference here for a couple of days. It's in San Diego. And, um, and my church, you know, gave me permission to go. And I went down there and I met a bunch of people who were a lot like me, who love their city in a holistic way and um and we're making a, a big difference in what they're doing and and we're farther along than i and i was and i just remember being so affirmed you know mm. and it's just so energized and just going there's something here that might be more than just a church program that lasts a year or two years and it dies out and then you go to the next church program i felt like no this is something <clears throat> that this could be longer than that I didn't know it'd be this long <laughs> and uh, I know it's going to be longer, <clears throat> but I was just, I was just so encouraged um, being in that, that room with so many amazing people in that room. And, and Glenn is the one that organized this and organized that whole conference. And he was, he's been ahead of this game uh, way more than most. And I'm just so encouraged by what he's meant to me, how he's inspired me, how he's come to Modesto and he's seen this and he's wrote about Modesto and, uh, and now he's here with us. So I want you all to welcome Glenn Barth. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you, Jeff, for that kind introduction. You know, um, I really did enjoy my uh, years coaching down in Modesto with John Evans and Tom Siccarelli and, yeah, and uh, yeah. you and, and some of the other leaders who are still so active down there. And uh, it, was, it was a thrill to me to see the way that Love Modesto grew. 
and um, and people really caught the vision that you know they could see the concrete work and the difference that was being made in Modesto by you and some other leaders who are active there in uh, really seeking to serve your city and uh, to see today now that that uh, the vision of Love Modesto has translated into many many other cities across our country and communities where Christians and others are coming together to serve their city in ways that really glorify God and, uh, and expand his kingdom work. And uh, so I'm thankful for Love Our Cities and I'm thankful for each of you here today. It's good to see a few familiar faces on this today. Lynn Heatley, I've known for many years, she's a pioneer in this field as well and doing such great work in prayer, but also I really believe in changing uh, the uh, spiritual atmosphere of, uh, of her community uh, down in the Riverside area of, uh, of California. So glad to see you. And of course, uh, Chris Handley, I understand Chris has a number of people looking in on this. You must be uh, putting it up on a big screen, Chris. Is that right? Well, uh, Chris and I and a number of other leaders in uh, Florence uh, really had a, such a, a joyful time uh, together as, uh, as he launched uh, Helping Florence Flourish uh, through a series of coaching and, and other things that we did together there. And then a new friend of mine is uh, Kim Francis, who has been uh, driving, and I hope not watching this as she's driving too much, but I, I saw her on here today from New Braunfels. She called me a few weeks ago, and I was able to connect her with uh, leaders who I coached in uh, San Antonio. Texas, uh, a group called Unicity there. And uh, so she, she'll have a fellowship right not too far away from her, where she can really work on some things uh, regionally, uh, as well as in New Braunfels, as she's been doing so well through SurfSpot. But, uh, you know, um, you, you asked me to tell a little bit about my background uh, earlier. Uh, and I, I just, uh, when I think back on how long I've been involved in this. Um, I came to know Jesus Christ at the age of 17. And it was through some folks who uh, were coming out of Pittsburgh with a vision to make Pittsburgh more famous for God than steel. I lived uh, in a Western suburb of Cleveland and, uh, and they had drawn a 150 mile radius around Pittsburgh to, um, influence, to, to plant a Young Life Club on every high school campus within 150 miles of Pittsburgh to influence the future leadership who might come to Pittsburgh and work in Pittsburgh in business or in, uh, in any area of life, education, you name it. And, uh, and somehow or another, when they came to Cleveland, I heard the gospel in a very simple way, the four spiritual laws, and I responded uh, because I sensed Jesus' presence in the room and knew I wanted to surrender and serve him forever from that point forward. And that vision of having the body of Christ work together in order that God might become more famous in their community than whatever that community was known for before was something that I felt every community needed wherever we were. And, um, and so throughout my journey in life, whether it was with my college fellowship or doing college ministry with the Coalition for Christian Outreach, or I served three churches. Uh, the largest was Colonial Church of Edina that brought me to Minnesota, where I currently live. And um, I, would, I would work to bring pastors and other Christian leaders together to serve the city. In, uh, in Muncie, Indiana, for instance, we when I came there, they asked me to be the vice president of the Ministerial Association, which I think was a big mistake on their part. They had no idea that I had this big vision. <laughs> it wasn't long before we had 200 churches serving together out of the 600 churches in that county um, to serve among the poor and to make sure needs were met so people wouldn't go homeless. We, we, uh, we had a Miracles Can Happen fund that funded people uh, when they were in financial difficulty and help them get back on track with their lives. And uh, we, we pooled our, our, uh, our local missions funds to help serve the community. And we did, uh, we did regular service projects and service days where many hundreds in, uh, of uh, volunteers would come out that kind of similar to what you're doing now in so many communities. So uh, just, as a, just as a bit of background, and then I, I uh, when I, uh, after Muncie, I came to 
Colonial Church of Edina. I was there for a few years. And then Paul Cedar asked me to help him start something called the Mission America Coalition. And, um, and I was asked to be the, the founding chief operating officer because I'd been an executive pastor. I think he thought I could do it. And, uh, I did that for a little while. And then I, I, I had told him, I said, my real love is to help people work together in their cities to serve their cities and to expand the kingdom right there in their cities. And so he made me the head of the city and community ministries. And I worked with Jarvis Ward there for about 10 years to try to model how black and white Christians could work together to, uh, to build coalitions that would have a powerful witness, a John 17 type of witness in their community. Um, today, I, I lead uh, Good Cities. Good Cities was started as City Reach International. For those of you who go back a little ways, uh, Jack Dennison started that in 1998. And, uh, and uh, Good Cities came into being in 2007 when, uh, when Jack was no longer able to lead that ministry, uh, my uh, two brothers, uh, Eric Swanson and Sam Williams came to me and said, Glenn, uh, we've got an opportunity to have this nonprofit. Would you consider possibly doing this? And I said, you know, I was really interested because at the time Mission America was really doing, I think a lot of good work, but it was national initiatives being brought to local communities and some communities would buy into it and some wouldn't. And I think as I got to know all you kind of city, all you city leaders, I realized how much the Holy Spirit was leading you all in uh, developing contextualized solutions. But, but I could see that there was leadership development that really needed to be done with these leaders so that we could see more volunteers and more resources poured into this kind of work. And, uh, and, and so good cities, is something that doesn't come in with a program, but we come alongside leaders and we listen carefully to what you're trying to do. And we wanna help you become the kind of leader that really empowers others around you to be released into their giftings and callings. Uh, we say good cities develops leaders who advance the common good of the city and the gospel of the kingdom in measurable ways. And uh, that's really our real hope with Good Cities is that we, that we put wind in your sails. And uh, so um, we've, to date, we've had the chance to work uh, closely with about uh, 28 cities across the country now. Uh, and um, we've, we've held conferences like Jeff talked about, and uh, Chris was at one of them, uh, where we've had literally hundreds of leaders come out to those one day conferences, we call those city convene. We don't do those very often and we used to do them about once or twice a year, but we really found that the best thing for us to do was to begin to really pour into leaders through coaching and through intensive uh, leadership development that we call the City Impact Accelerator. Reggie and I are doing a, a City Impact Accelerator in uh, Florida right now. Reggie McNeil is my colleague. Uh, some of you might know Reggie, especially those of you in South Carolina. Reggie has written many books um, uh, about the kingdom and about the, uh, the movement of God's people working together to change the lives of people, institutions, and cities. And he's just a brilliant writer and thinker, and I'm glad to have him on my team. When we hired Reggie, he said, Glenn, you can, you know, you're, you're the president, and uh, my title will be the other guy. <laughs> I'll tell you, I love Reggie's sense of self-deprecating uh, humor, but we were, uh, one, of the, one of the things we're doing with our City Impact Accelerator, which is a, uh, it's about an eight-month process where we do three day-and-a-half conferences uh, with leaders from cities. We can have up to 60 participants. We intentionally keep these small, and um, the Salvation Army is hosting us in Florida, and we've now worked with six cities in Florida, and we have six more coming on this fall in October. And uh, in the first one, what we did was we said to them, we want you to bring a team from your city that includes uh, a couple people from your organization. But then what we'd like is for you to reach as high as you can, bring people from, uh, from the county commissioner's office, bring people from the mayor's office, bring people who are philanthropists, bring people who are educators, bring people who are in business. 
And uh, each of you can have a team of six. And uh, so they brought their teams and uh, one of the teams, uh, Orlando, by the way, Jeff, I see that uh, Sarah Abrams uh, is in the waiting room. I don't know if you've let her in or not, but um, um, so anyway, I just wanted to uh, say that the exciting thing was the people from Orlando brought with them a county commissioner, uh, a leader from the, um, the mayor's office, a key business leader and a philanthropist with them. And as they worked through our sessions, we teach a lot about collective impact and how you can utilize collective impact to make a long-term difference in your community. Uh, and uh, it's a very powerful process that, uh, that involves developing deep partnerships among folks who have a similar focus in their, in their work in the community. And then they use shared measurement to measure whether or not they're making the impact they think they are in the community. But uh, the Salvation Army in, uh, in Orlando had these folks come with them. And by the third session, they had developed a plan and, uh, and the, the county commission in Osceola County and the county commission in Orange County, where Orlando is, both agreed to, to release $30 million each, so $60 million to form two affordable housing, to, to build two affordable housing uh, projects in those communities that would house 120 families. See, Orlando had been affected by uh, the earthquakes in Haiti and people were displaced and came to Orlando from there and the hurricane that you know devastated Puerto Rico and, uh, and the Puerto Ricans had come in large numbers as well, but they hadn't come with jobs. They hadn't come with the kinds of things that provided the economic support they needed. And then they asked the Salvation Army if they would work with local nonprofits who would help these folks move from uh, poverty to uh, having a good job that was paying a family supportive wage and to put those nonprofit service agencies and even the government agencies on the first floor of each of these large new uh, housing units, housing these families that are trying to make this transition. Um, other things happened there as well. There was in Winter Haven, Florida, for instance, uh, they were donated a four-story building as a new service center from the, uh, uh, from the uh, community there that they might use as a, uh, as a place uh, to shelter the homeless and, to, and, uh, and then to help uh, provide their social services that they would provide. Another experience we had last, uh, last year as well was with uh, our friend Eric Johnson, who some of you may know down in uh, the uh, Monterey area. And um, we had a guy who was working with us uh, and who would uh, help him to develop the kind of uh, technological support for the 30 churches he had working together in Monterey serving 15 um, homeless encampments there. I know uh, homelessness in California and some of the warmer climates is a pretty big uh, topic for many of you. And uh, they, they were able to work with local business leaders in the, uh, in the community and government leaders to begin to identify the people in the families there and begin to think through how do we help folks transition from homelessness into, uh, in, into having um, uh, jobs with family supportive wages. And uh, of course, those of you who know Eric Johnson, he has such a big vision. He's working with the prison system in California to uh, help prisoners learn construction skills by building tiny houses. And uh, in fact, I think one of the tiny house villages is right now going into a church property in Modesto. Is that right, Jeff? No, that's exciting. So we try to be very practical in what we do. And I want to tell you one other story here. And that is a few years ago, I went to speak at a gather conference in London, England. And all over England since 2008, um, the, uh, the church has become... Uh, the focal point of service in communities all over, all over England, all over the UK. Um, when, when they had 2008, the crash happened there, they decided instead of pumping money into their economy like we did, they would go an austerity route 
and they asked the churches if they would take over service facilities that had been run by the government all over England. And the church stepped up to the plate in community after community, and it revived the church. I really believe that what you're doing is led by the Holy Spirit and can revive the church in, in untold ways and bring unity in incredible ways. Um, I, I uh, think of the passage that uh, when Jesus, of course, the, the core of Jesus' teaching was about the kingdom of heaven. And uh, he was so imaginative in the way that he taught about it. But a couple of core elements were shared in Matthew chapter 19 or 18, verse 19 through 20, where he says, again, truly, I tell you that if two of you on earth agree about anything they ask for, it'll be done by them are done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three gather in my name, there am I with them. And uh, I just wanna just say right now that uh, unity at its most powerful and basic element is when two agree. And hopefully you have a friend who's working with you, a brother or sister in Christ, who's working with you in, in the work that you're doing. That's so important. And that's the strongest kind of witness you can have in the community is that you have somebody and that you're not just a lone ranger out there trying to do, the, do it all. Uh, you, you can quickly become a one-armed paper hanger when that happens. But uh, by agreeing on these things, the kingdom is released by God in powerful ways. And, and it just takes two. And then he says, where two or three gather in my name, there I am in the midst. Sometimes we think John 17, 20 and 21, we think that that's about bringing hundreds or thousands together in our community. But that kind of unity is weak compared to the unity that you experience with your best friend or with your husband or wife uh, or with uh, a family member or that kind of unity be between a close person that you love and serve with and pray with and sweat with, that kind of unity is powerful and changes communities in powerful ways. I know that we're in difficult times. Last night, I called my friend Kemp Boyd in Akron. Um, he leads Love Akron there. He's an African-American leader. And uh, you may have all heard about the police shooting there where, um, Jalen uh, Walker was gunned down by uh, eight policemen as he ran away unarmed um, from them. And uh, they fired 90 rounds, eight police officers. Only one was black of those eight. And uh, even when he was down, they, they kept shooting him. He, they found his body with 60 bullets in it. And, um, and that whole community now is, is struggling uh, in, in very significant ways, most with the grief of what happened. Even the police chief, when he was seeking solace with Kemp, said to, said to him, this shouldn't have happened. And, uh, you know, we're, we're seeing uh, different ways that our churches are broken between black and white Christians, and yet God sees the church as one. And, uh, and that church unity needs to come about if we're going to stop these kinds of injustices in our society. Uh, on July 4th, I, I got a call from my sister who told me about my Jewish sister and brother-in-law in Highland Park, uh, where you know there was a shooting as well. We have these random shootings taking place, and uh, my, fortunately, my family was not injured there. but. Uh, but seven died and over 30 were killed by Robert, Robert Cremo the, the third. The unity of the church is powerful. And if we agree about these things, we'll see an end come to them. There will be creative ways that we begin to solve these seemingly intractable problems. And uh, I just want to encourage all of you in the good work that you're doing to keep it up and to keep looking for ways to serve. Now, Jeff, I was going to share a few slides about good cities, but you know what? I may have used my time up already. Um, if you think I have time to share about three minutes on good cities, I will. But Please otherwise, do. we can just open for questions. 
why don't hey, why don't we open up for questions? And before you leave here, let's I want you, let's, let's share those slides. So maybe this, okay. yeah, well, let's let's open it up right now. Yeah, go it, ahead. What's the website that I might look at? I've guessed a few, but can't find it. Yeah, it's really hard to find. It's a uh, it's goodcities.net. Net. Okay. Yeah, that's why you know .net would make sense for a group like us, right? <laughs> But it's not .org, it's .net. Okay. So I chatted with uh, Jeff a moment ago about what the, uh, how to find out about the affordable housing project. That sounded very compelling. And I, I think you'll uh, also share this when you put up your screen, but um, the material about Reggie McNeil would be uh, the, what do you call that, city? City impact oh, the, the city impact accelerator. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, I think uh, uh, Jeff gave me an email for Eric. Seems like that's the best way to get more information about that. The affordable housing project. Is that the one yeah. in Orlando? The one in Orlando. I'll, I'll send this out in the email follow up here. About okay. Eric Johnson. He's usually on this. He's usually on this call, by the way. Um, okay. So, yeah, he's doing incredible things and and it's happening here as well. And on church properties, church prop churches own so much land in our cities, and that's not being used. It's sitting vacant, you know. And so, you know, a number of churches around here have are starting to build. There's a lot of red tape, man. <laughs> There's a lot of hoops to jump through to build anything. A lot of permits and all that stuff. But it's finally happening. Uh, a number of churches are are having these little houses these tiny houses that are built on their property and um, and they get a chance to, to host them, you know, host these people. And um, it's, yeah, it's a beautiful model for sure. That's great. Well, Chris, you know how to reach me. So, and, and anyone else on this line, it's Glenn, G-L-E-N-N, -N, two N's in Glenn at goodcities.net. And um, if, if you want to ask any questions about any of the stories that I told, I'll be happy to uh, connect you with the people involved. Right. Glenn, let me ask you this. You know, you brought up some, you know, I know Kemp as well, you know, in Akron, and you, you brought up the reality of what's going on in our cities. And, and then you, you shared about how, you know, the church can and should engage. How do you see that happening? How do you see that best happening? How can, how can we, enter in that conversation and still be bridge builders in the community, not be too take sides politically in a way, you know, but yet try to unite. How do we be that? How can we be that uniters in our community? The first thing is to, if you haven't done it already, is to begin to get black and white pastors meeting together. Uh, pastors in the black pastors in the black community are really in touch with what's going on. They know the gang leaders. They, they know uh, they know everyone who's there. And so if, if uh, the white church has uh, often isolated itself and focused on piety, uh, piety is a wonderful thing. I love, I love people who seek to be holy. Uh, but at the same time, I'd say this, that uh, we live in this real world and we want to develop friendships with people. And so... Um, I know in Muncie, around the time of the LA riots and Rodney King, uh, as the leader of Christian Ministries of Delaware County, I looked around and said, we're not doing a very good job on this. Let's, uh, I, and I, I actually called a news conference with uh, the director of human rights in the city and uh, several of the black pastors. And I, and I made a commitment that we would begin to, to work on this. I, I made a huge public commitment to do it. And then the leading black, pastor, black pastors and, black, and white pastors began to meet in a very public place, the MCL cafeteria at the Muncie Mall every Monday for lunch and just worked at getting to know one another and what the issues were so that we understood them better. And we then began to invite city officials in like the head of the merit board for hiring in the fire and police department. And we asked him, why is the, why is the department so white when they're serving among black people in the city? What's going on? And, uh, and they told us, well, 
you have to pass these, you know, everything. The reason is because you have to pass these standards and we haven't had African-American candidates do that. We said, how can we develop a pipeline? You know, we began, you know, to really work at it. And we asked tough questions. We had the superintendent of schools in and said, what are you doing for diversity education? We're seeing black kids succeed up through eighth grade, but when they get to high school, they're falling off the map. What's going on? You know, and, um, you know, we asked hard questions of the city officials. The news media began to take notice in the area. They said, holy cow, there's a whole new leadership group in our city. It's the pastors of the churches and they're, they're coming together and, and doing things we haven't seen before, you know? And, um, and we, we prayed with the mayor for a, an hour every, every week before we started work. And when the city council heard about it, they said, we want a pastor to come pray before our city council meetings. They didn't call the ACLU. They said, we want prayer, <laughs> you know? So you get to know the issues of your city. You address them in relevant ways. But you really, for the black and white issue here, it's not so much about getting out to lead a protest. It's really about digging in and, and developing those relationships that, that, uh, that reflect two people agreeing on earth so that the heavenly, our heavenly father will answer from heaven. It's, it's that. It's good, thank you. Just wanted to say hi, Glenn. Really good to see you after many, many years. <laughs> yeah, hi, Glenn. Good As to Glenn see you. Indicate we go way back to Mission America and City Impact Roundtables and Phil yeah. and Jarvis and the whole crew. So yeah. good to see you're doing the great work that you are. I did want to ask you about um, partnerships with government because that's pretty much the lane I'm in instead of creating a lot of things other than the citywide serve day there's a lot that's happened with favor with government and joining them and being a strong partner at their table so how are you seeing that kind of stuff happen in some of your other circles well you know i i look at you and i think about the stories that i've heard you know from from your people when i've come come to your city and it was so exciting but i look i think about chris handley you know, uh, Chris, I know the government came to you when you started helping Florence flourish and they gave you a huge task right away. And uh, in fact, your government people showed up at uh, this, the uh, city convene meeting we held in your city, didn't they? You wanna talk about that a little bit? Yeah, they were, they were there and, and um, we have had a lot of favor in, in Florence that's continued over the years. And, and uh, they invited me to be on a, uh, community development committee that that has a lot to do with housing, uh, and that's a city a city committee. That, and so they continue to be real open to our involvement. We one of the city council women is also a pastor, and so she comes to our oh. past she comes to our pastor's monthly gathering that we do, and and so she's our direct connection to uh, all things city. The, the mayor is very warm to us. The city's city has uh, made a, a house build very possible that we were involved in, and they they uh, collaborated with us to demolish an old house. They did the they ex, did the expense of that for us, took care of that, and then we built a house back on the same property. So, once you build those relationships, there's all kinds of things that are possible uh, as the um, you go forward. Hey, Glenn, go ahead and share your slides and, and we'll close out here. Oh, okay. Happy to do that. Just give me one sec here. Oh, I know. Hang on. Um, one sec here. I had them up last night. It's funny thing what happens overnight here. Give me one sec. Uh, I'm gonna get out of the share mode here for a second. This is, this is it's always classic Zoom. Like you, you do it like beforehand. I, I got everything ready, and then all of a sudden, when it's live, it doesn't work. Uh, yeah, why is that? Keeps us humble. Um, God, because God is keeping us humble. That's what. <laughs> that's why it is, man. It keeps me humble. All right, hang on. Oh, that's so funny. Um, 
Okay. All right. I'm going to go back to try to share this again. Let's just come back. Sorry about that, guys. He does keep us humble, no doubt about it. There it is. Okay. I'm just going to share something uh, fairly quickly with you here. Let me uh, pull this down and I'm just going to play it as a slideshow. Um, I only have like, uh, I'm going to do five slides pretty quick here. Uh, is, does it does the slide is that is that working now that looks better okay so i told you our vision earlier we develop leaders who advance the common good of the city and the gospel of the kingdom in measurable ways and what we do as a mission is to discover support and serve vibrant movements that serve cities by building processes that create good cities and we don't hang around for a long time like we were in modesto for maybe a year or so working with some of the leaders, but today they're using those same processes that we created back in 2009 and 2010 to develop all kinds of collaborations. I think that's true, isn't it, Jeff? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I think that's exciting. To me, it's, uh, we kind of play, I'm a trout fisherman, I, I, so I'm a, I'm a catch and release guy, you know? I don't like to hang on to things too long. I, I help folks and then we move on. And uh, we really believe in leadership, innovation, and collaboration. Um, our services are threefold. We will coach if you want to invite us in as a coach, either Reggie or me. Um, and uh, we have a couple of processes that are really we're well known for, kind of a motivational interviewing process that helps us understand where people would really like to see change happen in their community and how committed they are to collaborating to change it. And then Really help you develop your strategy and implement it uh, in start with a small group uh, and end up with thousands of people involved, which is fun to see. Uh, the City Impact Accelerator, I described that earlier, it's three day and a half sessions over about eight months. And then we can add a, a coaching element on the end of that. Uh, we we really have uh, gotten so much uh, request for some of our other services that uh, we're not doing the city convene quite as often. Area of dominant, and we look for what's working, and then we do, we develop some content. We point people to content that we know about. And then we, see, we seek to feed that back into the system so that every part of our country has uh, effective leadership teams working using some of the best practices that we know about. We work with every domain in the community oftentimes and encourage our folks to do that, to provide info in their city. And we try to help folks develop an effective covenant community that will mobilize the people of God to uh, in their own cultural context, and you'll note that the that the people of that that the people of God is a broke. It's the only broken line in this diagram, because it's a it's a centered set, and it means that people can come into that set. They can they can join from the cultural context, and and uh, they can be a part of moving their community toward a greater sense of the reign of God in their community, and the people of God uh, as change agents are always working to bring a greater sense of God's will being done on earth as it is in heaven, of, uh, of their city becoming more like the heavenly Jerusalem that will one day be revealed. And that's it, Jeff. All right, thank you, Glenn, so much. Hey, everyone, if, if you wanna get in contact with Glenn, if you wanna learn more about Good Cities, how they can come alongside of what you're doing and just have that conversation and seeing what might work best for you, obviously, please contact Glenn. Glenn, you're the website again, goodcities.net, goodcities.net. That's right. You can get a hold of them there. And I'll have Glenn's email address in the follow-up email.
as well. Hey, next month, I know I know we're a little late here. Next month, this guy's going to be with us. Uh, it's blurred out here. Dave Runyon from oh. uh, uh, The Art of Neighboring. Uh, we talked a lot about, you know, a lot of people in our cities are wondering, hey, where do I get started in my city? You know, well, start with your neighbors. You know, I know it's overwhelming. Look at your whole city, but maybe just start with your neighbors, the ones who live around you. And so Dave's going to be with us. This is one of the most impactful books that I've read. Our, our book is actually modeled a lot after this book, super practical, a lot of great stories. And I'll put that in the email as well. I know we're late. We got to, we got to go guys. Thank you so much. <laughs> I appreciate you all. Glenn, thank you again. God bless right, you. Have a great day. You guys. Have a good day. All right. All right bye-bye. Bye now.